Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth podcast. The Projection Booth is single-handedly the greatest film podcast you could ever listen to or could possibly want. Top notch. Five stars. This has quickly become one of my favorite film-related podcasts. Always interesting. A completely unpretentious yet fully comprehensive look at films from all genres. The Projection Booth podcast with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. You guys look like, what do they look like, Jimmy? Dorks. <laughs> they look like a couple of dorks. Get those birds! They're coming to get you, Barbara. What are you kidding? We got us a family here. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? You are listening to the In the Mouth of Dorkness podcast. The official podcast of the Alamo Draft House Winchester. Here are Brad, Lisa, and Darren. Welcome to another edition of the It Modcast podcast. Joining us is Lisa Gullickson. Quick, suck it before the venom reaches my heart. Wife Dork. Some people call me Pringles Dick, but I never really found out why. Some people call me Pringles Dick, I just keep my dick inside. Keep my dick inside a Pringles can, cause it keeps my penis warm and dry. Some people call me Pringles dick, but I never really found out. No, I never found out, never really found out why. And also joining us is Brad Gullickson. And for gosh sake, watch your language. That's not going away anytime soon. Mouth door. My balls say, we should just take it easy right here. Why do your balls sound like three-year-old girls? I don't know, man. That's just how they talk. But they're wise. <laughs> and I'm your host, Terry Smith. Warm. Warmer. Disco. The Disco Dork. ka -chow. Hey, welcome to the It Modcast <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Yay. Uh, that's a, that's, that was a wild one. That was, <laughs> that was kooky. You don't even know, listeners. You don't even know. Uh, I did so, that in one take. So welcome back. Not eight yeah. takes. <laughs> Some people I'm not a ukuleleist. A what? A ukuleleist. <laughs> yes. It's not Some one of my skill sets. Uh, but you have a very, very promising really future in ukuleleism. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Some people Being call a ukuleleist. Is that like the invitation? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it feels good to be back here. Oh my yeah. god! I barely remember what you guys look like. Who is this? What's going on? Um. So uh, we are minus one dork. <laughs> Which dork? I count, I'm counting one, two. Isn't this our usual number? Of yeah, dorks? that's right. I'm so silly. I'm so silly. I forget. So anyway, no. <laughs> wait, what? We're missing the Billy. turtle dork. No, oh. the turtle dork's missing. Darren. Oh, His yeah. name is Brian Young. He's at Brian the turtle Young. dork one on Instagram, and then at the turtle dork on Twitter. And be young video on Facebook. He shouldn't be Brian with a Y. He should be Brian with a where. <laughs> As in where are you, Brian? <laughs> it's been busy for him. He's been, you know, real world making the dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Where the fuck have I been? The Matrix? I've been real world and shit. I don't think so. Not like Brian. Uh, look at my bank account. I would like to look at your <laughs> bank account. Could you share some? I can't. No. <laughs> oh, how's your week in Dork? Your weeks in Dork? We haven't. What, it's been like two. Weeks, it's been two weeks, weeks since we've had um, a, a week in Dork. It's know? been more than that because we did the uh, Wonder Woman cast, and then before oh, yeah. that we did the um, Mummy. Well, no, we never got to the Mummy cast. No, mummy no, because we all saw the Mummy, and science. we were just like, the world don't need no <laughs> Mummy cast. Man. But there was something before that. We did a lot, so let's do this. Uh, while I think about and chronicle what I did, actually I have everything written down. You're, you're not going to run down <laughs> every movie you've watched in the last two weeks, but this are is what, you? But this, so our friend Brian has gifted us extra time. Oh boy! So you get to talk about two things. Oh, okay. You get to talk about two oh, things. Oh, good, because I planned two and, things. And Darren, <laughs> and Darren gets to talk about twenty things. Yay! Thank you, Brian. <laughs> All right, uh, Lisa, yes. kick it off. How was your weeks in Dork? Can't we just start out by saying we had an awesome, awesome con? Oh, I'm, yeah. No, awesome Con. So, this, we're recording this the Monday following Awesome Con, mm -hmm. and we still have that awesome glow. We're recording this on the 19th of June, mm. one month away from, from San Diego Comic Con. Yes. 
I'm not ready. I have seven pounds. I have to lose seven pounds. Oh, of what? Cookie weight, shape weight, potato <laughs> chip weight? <laughs> yeah, all of Con that. Con weight. I, I've been, uh, <laughs> I've, I've been uh, stocking up for the winter six months, six to ten months early. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have... I have 17 pounds to lose. If you have seven, I have 17. <laughs> but yeah, Awesome Con was awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was very successful. I had my Writing with Purpose panel. You did great. Uh, with Liz Reed from Cuddles and Rage and Emily Sears from Birth, Movie, Death. And it was really, really wonderful. An absolute dork highlight. Um, stay tuned, listeners, for later in the week. We will have that panel for you yes. in episode form. Yes. It's really wonderful, though. It's I think anybody who has any kind of creative endeavors can find some encouragement and some motivation in your guys' panel. I'm hoping to listen to it and find some of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> if you have been following It Mod on social media, you will have seen the pictures uh, from that panel. And I have to say, uh, I was just giddy seeing you all up there, especially seeing Brad up there. I just thought that that was a... A pretty awesome site. Hey, and, I know them. I know people yeah. doing a panel. It's so cool. Yeah. Uh, so I hope that uh, we would see more of you in the future doing something similar. Same. I hope that also. Yeah. I need more Spank Bank material. Wow. All right. And <laughs> we bought a ton of t-shirts. Speaking of Spank Bank material, oh. we bought. I bought a ton of t-shirts in preparation for Comic Con. I finally found a Kamala Khan Ms. Marvel shirt. I'm so stoked. Ooh. I found a super sweet, um, oh, shoot. Uh, the Fifth Element. Yeah, Fifth Element. Uh, for some reason, I kept thinking Final Destination. I'm like, I don't think that's oh. it. If Fifth you started Element. wearing Final Destination <laughs> shirts, oh, yeah. That would be un- awesome. uh, out of character for me. But Fifth Element is a film I enjoy. So. I saw uh, Lilu and a Ruby Rod. Did you yes, see Ruby Rod there? I did. The that she was looked, amazing. Um, it was a gender bendy, and it was... St- that that girl was like an eleven. She was stunning. Wait, stunning the Ruby woman. Rod? Yeah. Did you not know that that I was a chick? That's, that's awesome. I just I just saw I just kept focusing on the hair and the outfit. And the, oh no, like, man! Like, did they specially make that, or did they order they, that? Yeah. Like, they, it was definitely tailor made. That was awesome. Yeah, form awesome. fitting. It was lovely. Mm. She was lovely. Um. So yeah, awesome con was awesome. My first awesome con. Really? Yeah. Uh, I I. Uh, so I was always apprehensive about going to Awesome Con because um, stubbornly I, I you're was, like it's not San Diego. I, I F th- this. I thought that I thought that was going to be my mind frame going into Awesome Con, and I didn't want to go there and be disappointed that oh man, this isn't San Diego, and then not have a good time at Awesome Con. So that's why for the past couple of years um, I've never gone, but. You know, when you said that you were going to be on a panel, I mean, I have to go to that. I have to go support Brad. And so I go there, and instead of it being, oh, man, this is not San Diego, you know, I, I just – it just immediately reminded me of – and not not taking away from Awesome Con, but it, it immediately reminded me of that thing that I love about San Diego, seeing all the cosplay, that the community of the fellow geeks there, and it just got me more excited for uh, San Diego Comic It's a huge <laughs> cosplay community oh, man, here yeah. in D.C. Yeah. Brad got me introduced to comic book conventions through these smaller cons, through Balticon and Philly Con. So these are kind of more what I'm used to, these kind of small, intimate tables, some shopping. Yeah. And, and I really think that the cosplay has just blown up in the last few years well i mean awesome con's only five years old and this year is certainly the largest it's ever been um friday was a little quiet but saturday was nuts Mm -hmm. Uh, it was crowded it was really great to see and you know the a a diverse mix uh in the crowd a lot of young kids which really gets me excited (laughs) Um, I, I just think that what they are doing at the DC Convention Center uh, w- with Awesome Con is phenomenal, and I, I believe it's only going to grow larger and larger. I hope so. Um, because I was thinking I was uh, in line with Jill. Hi, Jill, and um, and I was telling her, that, you know, I, I'm curious to see if, I mean, it's already happening with Awesome Con and, and how San Diego Comic Con didn't start out as big as it is now. Um. But over the years, it has grown in popularity, it has grown in attendance, and uh, grown in relevance. And I'm curious to see if um, Awesome Con 
does the same thing because it it's in a it's in a, a um a prime metropolitan area it's in a place that has a large like you said lisa a large um cosplay community um there's a large um there's a large film community there's a large geek community here on, on the east coast and in dc and maryland dc and virginia anyway and so I'm curious to see, and like San Diego Comic Con, if it becomes big enough, like the New York Comic Con as well, there will be people not just from this area. There will be people from other countries, other states that migrate. And I'm pretty sure that there already are people who are coming from different states to Awesome Con. So it'd be interesting to see uh, if Awesome Con grows like San Diego, being that we're from here. Because I can only imagine being in, being from San Diego or living in San Diego and every year seeing San Diego grow to become the the beast that it is now. Well, you know our buddy Eric um, uh, out in San Diego. The the worst thing that I think could possibly happen to us is if we lived in San Diego and yet we're not able to get into the Comic Con because that's happened I don't to him. See, even oh. say it. That that's happened to him a couple times yeah, yeah. Um, through a variety of circumstances, and I'm, I always feel really terrible for him. Do you really though? No, because I'm always there. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome con highlights this year was my picture with Toothless or Brad and I's picture with Toothless. This guy built like a a scale replica of Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon, yeah. and he was charging I think ten bucks to pose in front of Toothless and twenty bucks to sit on top of Toothless. But all of the proceeds went to Make a Wish, oh, which wow. is of course an amazing uh, charity for children who yeah. are in dire situations and just need some light in their life. And I yeah. just thought that that was such – that is such a, um example of the spirit of geekdom and yeah. how you can use your geekdom to bring a little light to the world yeah. and, and bring uh, goodness and, and, yeah, it was awesome. Was and awesome. super fun and resulted in, like, profile pic for life. I was going to say, it made for a cute picture. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I you know this was also the year that uh, Jimmy and Liz of Cuddles and Rage Yay. got to design the label for the official Awesome Con brew How beer. Cool is that Atomic Smash from uh, uh, Mill Tavern Brewing? Yeah, um, it was great, and the one the beer tasted delicious. It was good. I mean, even I drank it or yeah. half of it. Ooh. I don't really you like know, beer. It was being sold from one particular stand inside the dealer's room. And it was kind of wonderful to like load up on a you know this tropical fresh uh, wheat beer, and uh, you know roam down the alleys of uh, the artist artist way. Yeah. And, uh, doing that, um, it, it's weird. Uh, it's it, like uh, I was gonna say, you know how you go somewhere far away, and then you go there's some place that that has something there that you have back home and it quote unquote reminds you of home. Well, going down artist alley, I was getting ready to say, made me reminded me of home, like San Diego comic con <laughs> home. And it, and I, it was like a, I don't know, like a warm, uh, nostalgic, uh, romanticized feeling of like doing that. It really does year. get you in the mood. Yeah. It has, it, it has me aching for July 19th. It was the perfect primer, you know? And then I, 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 I had the, the Banff agent helmet on and, uh, that re being reminded again of little kids' responses, looking up to me, and uh, not looking up to me like uh, 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 an idol, but looking, look, literally looking up because they're small, and just seeing, oh wow, that's cool, or people stopping, asking to take pictures and stuff like that. It, again, it just took me back to last year and that experience that we had uh, all together. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I got the goosebumps now. <laughs> it, it was, uh, I don't know, like to be honest, I haven't been. <clears throat> I haven't been thinking about San Diego Comic Con this year going back um, as as often as I usually do. One because I'm so preoccupied with so much other stuff going on in my life right now, and two, I don't I, I don't want I just want to wake up and today's the day I get on the plane. You know what I mean? I don't want to draw it out. Um, but I have to say, like going to Awesome Con, like you just said, Brad, like it really put me in that headspace and like, oh shit, we're a month out. And then San Diego's coming, and again because I haven't been thinking about it, it, it I was, you know, I going to Awesome Con. It just brought back that experience of going there with you, Brian, Elisa, and you know, just that that time we shared uh, 
and the magic that we always talk about prior to going and when we come back and do our reviews. And so I don't know, like uh I guess I I guess I'm officially excited now. Yay! I'm ready. Well, this is not a joke. I came home from AwesomeCon on Sunday and I found my Captain America onesie and I threw it in the wash. I got that thing clean. Yeah. I am ready for the Hall H nightline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm excited now, and I, and I, I I'm gonna be a regular at AwesomeCon uh, because I it, I'd be foolish with this in my backyard to not go. And the one thing I would say is yes, we used it as an opportunity to clean up on geek T-shirts. Oh man, I got the greatest Bernie Wrights and Swamp Thing shirt. Yeah. I'm I'm saving that for Saturday. Yeah. Comic Con, um, but also there are so many wonderful comic book stores in the DMV and dealers. So this year, uh, more so than any other year at Awesome Con, you could really rack up a great deal on trade paperbacks. They had a lot of guys selling for fifty percent off. They had several booths selling, you know, bins and bins and bins of five dollar trade paperbacks, oh, wow. and I came away with two backpacks worth of comics. Jeez. I of course spent a hundred and eighty dollars on monkeys comics. I whenever we go, we look for the people carrying the old stuff. Yeah, because uh, the monkeys did a run of seventeen comics through Dell, and uh, yeah. They're pretty great. They're like more monkeys episodes. They're super silly. Yeah. They're really fun and collectible as shit. And, you know, again, before we move on, I just want to say thank you to Jimmy and uh, Liz for everything they've done for us. And they, they really do feel like, you know, the king and queen of uh, Awesome Con. Um, they, they're known quite well amongst that community and they... Uh, brought us in and introduced us to all co- manner of cool people, and uh, yeah, it was just it was a it was a wonderful night. Yeah. I had fun. Uh, Lisa, I'm sorry. Uh, you're a weekend dork. My weekend dork. So so now we've talked about this last week. So now I'm gonna go way back in time to the weekend before that, and mm-hmm. I had two fabulous nights in a row of stand up at the Arlington Draft House. That's right, you did. I love this venue. Um, it's a movie theater, but I've never actually seen a movie there. <laughs> I've only gone for stand-up shows. Uh, but it's a great venue. It's very wide and flat. Mm. And um, there's not a bad, bad seat in the house. Unlike uh, the DC Improv, which I also love, is like kind of like down in a basement. And there are like these like crazy pillars. And the stage is super small and it's really crowded. Um, Arlington Draft House is like more spread out. And as long as you get there early enough to sit behind a table, because it's one of those where, um, where you it's kind of like a dinner place too. So you have to, it's like sits four to a table. Oh, okay. But you know you want the power seat behind the table because yeah. the people in front of the table will have the table behind them Back. when they're facing the stage. Right. And so as long as you go go early enough to get a power seat behind a table, yeah. um, you're guaranteed to get a great show. Um. So I went there um, on Friday. Night. I don't know the, the exact ninth. tape. Okay, the ninth to see W. Kamau Bell. Do you know who W. Yep. Kamau Bell is? He's amazing. Um, he's had uh, shows on um, FXX and CNN. He does kind of a socio political comedy. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually discovered him. How did I discover him? I'm sure it was. Um, I'm sure it was through a podcast or something. But I. Uh, he had an album a couple years ago called Face Full of Flower, where he talked about um, – he talks a lot about race and um, he has a, a white wife and he talks about what it's like to be in an interracial relationship and raising uh, interracial kids. And he brings a lot of like personality and, and, and joy to it and a lot of perspective to it that I super enjoy. So when I saw him at the uh, that he was going to be at the Arlington Draft House, I had to just jump on that opportunity. Um, he also now currently has a so he's had um, two podcasts. Um, th- he does one called Denzel Washington is the greatest actor of all time. Period. Oh, Have you listened to guy. that? Yeah. Okay, that's right. Okay, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So amazing. So funny. And then he has a new podcast called Politically Correct. Uh, Politically reactive with another comedian I really enjoy, Hari Kondabolu. Mm. 
And um, it's on those same things, um, current events and, um, you know, social relationships and and things like that. So super interesting. Um, He had a new album come out uh, in 2016 called Semi-Prominent Negro. And he talked about how he's become kind of the person, the go-to, you know, black american to talk about to be on shows and and what's what's that like because the the responsibility of having to speak through for a whole group of people yeah and um he has a some really beautiful bits about about his daughter and um uh, both of his daughters one of them is uh he convinced his daughter his younger daughter that the way that you change the channel change bring on the next show on netflix is to stand in front of it with your hand out like this going wow 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 and his daughter just believed that because she's young and she's dumb so it was just really cute just you know just family stuff yeah. um so seeing him live was amazing he uh he, he kept on talking about how he had got up at 4 30 a.m to uh to get here because he's um a san francisco He's from San Francisco. He's a West Coast comedian. Oh. So he talked about having to like get up at 4.30 a.m. So whenever he had like a weird throwaway joke that was, you know, that you know, flat. I always found funny, but maybe fell a little flat. He would go like, 4.30 a.m., people. I just loved it. I he just started the he show so like lying on his side <laughs> yeah. on the floor yeah. and and basically performing to one woman in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> and for some reason, we all ended up singing American Pie. I cannot put so, it together. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Oh. I mean, it, 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 he was talking oh, about Brad went with me. how, you know, he just did a, a, a show in like Cutoff, Pennsylvania. And when you go to Cutoff, Pennsylvania, you fly into Ohio and then you get onto a propeller plane and you fly from that propeller plane into this tiny little city. And when he stepped onto that plane, and and you know you you don't book it through United you book it through Frank's air conditioning and flights. <laughs> <laughs> and when you go down that hallway, there's like one flickering light, and the rest is all darkness. <laughs> and he puts his foot onto the prop plane, and bye bye, Miss American <laughs> Pie starts playing. I like the bit about how he uh, they asked him how like before he got on the plane, he they asked him how much he weighed, and uh, he's a big guy. He's you know he's Brad's height. He's six four, and you know. He's got that lava lamp physique <laughs> like I do. So uh, he, he, but he was like four hundred and eighty pounds because he just wanted to like be on the like super safe and side. And so he starts singing, you know, American Pie, and he takes it to the chorus, and he gets the entire crowd to sing the rest of American Pie, not just the chorus, uh, and you know, not just Chevy to the Levy, but beyond. Yeah. And here you are, and and you're in a crowd of I don't know, like. 300 people and we're all singing American Pie together. <laughs> it was super beautiful. It I was loved beautiful it. And, and weird awesome. and wonderful. Yeah. But I I don't know. I the opportunity to see these people I admire so much and I consume through podcasts and I listen to every interview and I listen to their albums again and again and again. It's so cool to just see them in person, but it's also weird because I'm just, I'm just like, look, it's my favorite bestest friend, Kamal. And then after the show, uh, he was having, he has a new book out. Um, the Awkward Thoughts. Yeah, The Awkward Thoughts of W. Kamal Bell. And I had, in my ticket, I had paid for, you could pay for the book and the ticket together. Oh. And so I had, I had bought the book and I got to pick up the book and I got to meet him to sign it. But I, I was just like, I, I'm just so awkward meeting these people that I admire. But luckily he was wearing a Henry Wallens for president t-shirt. Yeah. So I at least could be like, hey, I, I like your t-shirt and I think you're keen. <laughs> he was super cool. Yeah. And, you know, uh, he took a selfie with us, you know, the, the obligatory post comedy show selfie. But he he. Did his time with Brad and Lisa, and yeah. it was wonderful. And he was super gracious and thankful. Um, and uh, I mean, there was no reason for be- him to be such a nice dude because his yeah. set was so great. He killed. He could have just been smug and been like, "Peace out." But the the fact that he took the time to meet us and sign the book was so nice. And he wrote in my book, "Lisa, be awesome." You know, yeah. and I will. We've seen so many great people at the Arlington Draft House. It it looks like. Um, a rather unassuming place. Yeah, it's right when you, there on the corner. Yeah, and, and it's in a weird piece of piece of neighborhood. It's like next to like a, a Chinese restaurant and a karate 
lesson studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've seen like Kamal Nanjiani there. We've seen Patton Oswalt there. Um, we saw uh, Moshe Kasher there. And get this, Darren. In September, when we the Saturday we fly back from awesome or uh, from San Fanta- Diego. no from Fantastic, Fantastic Fest. Fest. The Saturday we fly back from Fantastic Fest, Val Kilmer is going to be there doing a one man show. Is that the night? Uh, Last weekend. Uh, uh, we have some choices so to make. So much to do, so little. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. But Shit. it's going to be amazing. I, I mean, I'm super stoked. Uh, so the night after that, uh, I got to see Chris Gethard, who's another comedian that I adore. At the at the draft at house? the same at the same place yeah. we part um, this time Brad was not available to go with me stupid job so I was like who is super cool and often up for doing anything so I took Lisa at oh. Muse Girl yeah. from Film Club and she was like oh you know let me reimburse you for the tickets and I was like no because comedy is extremely subjective and this was also a taping of his podcast oh. and so this was like a long evening and i was like uh, there's a good chance you will not like this yeah. you know so i was like please please don't she did buy me a fun fruity drink the arlington draft house has like movie themed mm. cocktails and stuff like that so i got the pirates of the caribbean rum whatever oh. so good um so, uh, but Chris Gethard, you might know him from Don't Think Twice. Mm-hmm. He's the guy who uh, whose dad is sick in the beginning, and uh, and he did come from a community like that, like an improv community, and now he's mostly known for he has a new off Broadway show that's now become a HBO special called Career Suicide, mm. where he talks about being a performer while dealing with anxiety and depression and things like that so super intimate personal stories is his thing and it's also as a listener and as a consumer my thing yeah. and then um he has a huge podcast called beautiful anonymous so what beautiful anonymous is is at random times during the day he'll just tweet out a phone number and then anybody can call that phone number and talk to him for an hour, and he's not allowed to hang up. So um, so you would think initially that this would be like, you know, somebody calling up and saying diarrhea for like an hour, because that's what I do. But um, <laughs> what people end up doing is they they have this platform to talk about their lives and work out their personal issues and and talk about, like, there was like one episode where this woman, she was a sculptor and she what she likes to sculpt is uh houses for ghosts so there was that lady um there was a woman who escaped a cult there was you know so it's people who there's a guy who was debating whether or not he should buy his favorite local record shop oh. and he got encouragement from Chris Gethard to follow his dreams, you yeah. know? So it's that kind of thing where people just want to share this little piece of their lives and, and have this platform. Uh, so he's been, so this is part of a greater tour. The tour is actually over, um, but where he's been going from city to city and then doing the phone calls live, which has been to, in my opinion, as a faithful listener to mixed result, because not only do you have that intimate one-on-one with Chris Gethard, Now it's opened up to this crowd and Mm. this person wants to tell their super private, intimate story, but there's this crowd there and there's all these people there and and the dynamic is different. And so me bringing a friend and not knowing how the show was going to go, I I was a little nervous going in, but but I think that we lucked out. So he did the, the podcast first. And then his stand-up second. And so... Uh, how long was the podcast? The podcast oh. is an hour. Okay. So he did a little setup about how the podcast had been going in other cities. And um, apparently, I don't know if he says this to every club, but he said that the Arlington Draft House is one of his favorites. And it, and it and it did feel that way. Like, the, the room was super energized. Everybody was super ready for his, you know, brand of comedy. Mm. Excuse me. So, yeah, anyway. So it was just... 
the energy was really good. Um, one thing that I found interesting is that he invited an audience member to sit on the stage for the entirety of the podcast. So, so that when the timer, cause he had this huge like digital timer. Um, so when the timer ran out and an hour came up, they were supposed to make a noise or alert him. Okay. The time is up mm -hmm. so that they stop at the right time. And apparently on other cities, he had them play a Vuvuzela or whatever, but he lost, he forgot his Vuvuzela in another city. So he was just like, I just need someone at an hour to scream or say something so that the podcast can stop. And so he got somebody from the audience and he was like, okay, so I've had some issues in some other cities. So tell me now, um, are you sober? And she was just like, uh, she, I'm giving, I'm doing the like, so, so sign. And he's like, good enough for me. And he gave her a seat and the, this girl was lovely. Her name was Megan. Uh, she was a lovely strawberry blonde. She was wearing a romper. Very cute. Um, but during the process of the podcast, her husband in the audience was sending her beers. So in the course of an hour, she had drank in, drank, drank, drunk. I haven't had anything and I can't say it. She had drunk four steins of beer. Four in an hour. And so me as an emetophobe is watching this girl get oh, to continuously yeah. drunker and I started getting really scared. Thus, and also, she's supposed to be like this silent participant, yeah. but all of a sudden, Drunky McDrunkerson has questions for the caller, and uh -oh. I was just like, shut the fuck up, lady. I did not pay to see Megan's take on this call, <laughs> uh, but he was super open to it, and the audience, um, the audience, so at the beginning, before the pot, before the, the actual taping began, he gave the audience a secret hashtag that they could use to ask their own questions so that um, so that he could follow that on the stage. And so if something interesting came up from the audience, he could ask the caller, you know, questions yeah. or just comments or whatever. And so our secret hashtag was sports related. So I'm not going to remember it. Uh, something, something like something about John Wall. Something about John Wall. No, yeah. like don't nobody can protect John. I don't know. It was long and it was sports related, and I used it at the time. Um, but why did I bring that up? Oh, so as the show was going on, we were allowed to keep our phones out so that we could uh, participate. But I was also using it to kind of monitor what other people in the audience were saying because I'm going like, because <laughs> I'm not going to like, you know, I'm not going to tweet, you know. Get Megan off the stage. She's if she throws up, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> you know, but you know, some people were like, "Yay, go Megan! More pa more beers for Megan!" And other people were like, "You know, like so let's slow it down on the beers, Megs." Yeah. <laughs> um, so that that added an interesting element. This sounds incredibly painful to watch. It was, it was, <laughs> and then also the caller was kind of your typical beautiful anonymous caller, um, in that he had a kind of unique story that he was ready to tell and he wanted to tell it. Um, and so this guy's story was that he got married kind of young and he had gotten divorced. And in his divorce, he's discovering certain sexual things about himself. So he's been exploring the world of BDSM and things like that. So and then here's Megan chiming in with <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> okay. yeah, so he was talking about like, you know, he, you know, had a thing he kept on repeating was that his bed now had permanent straps. <laughs> and he kept oh. on repeating that. So, but it turned out to be a pretty good call. Chris is really good about asking the question that you want to ask and yeah. and um you know, leading the caller into revealing more. Also, uh, he had just gone in, well, a couple of weeks ago, he had just gone on his first mushroom trip. And uh, he lives with his grandfather. So during his mushroom trip, he was like sitting with his grandfather. Oh, no. Yeah, but his grandfather seems like a cool, cool grandfather. Like his grandfather is also on Tinder and works out a lot oh, and okay. smokes pot. So his gra grandfather sounds cool. So it turned out to be uh, all in all, not to, to sum up the whole call, but all in all, it was a really good episode, I think. I think we lucked out on our caller. Yeah. And so after that, there was like a 30-minute break. And then we got to the stand-up portion. How long was that set? 
Um, it would. It was like an hour. It was like a standard. Man, set. that's a good deal. Like yeah. It- well, it was thirty dollars to see. That's yeah, a really good to deal. see the podcast taped live and to see the stand up. Yeah. And um, you know, and there was two openers. Um, one of the openers, Denise Taylor, is a a local. The host, I guess, is a local chick. She's like half white, half Middle Eastern. Yeah. Um, and I thought she was pretty funny, and and she had also opened for W. Kamau Bell, so I had the excitement of getting to compare her set from one night to the next. Yeah. And I, she did. There were three like little differences and um, tweaks to her set, which I found very like as a consumer of stand up, I found really interesting, yeah. and I, I like to compare and contrast. And I thought that she was pretty funny. Um, and then he had brought with him a stand up from New York. Named Joe Rumrill, who, who, I mean, I, I didn't. He was not my particular style. He's more like bizarre joke, jokey jokes, like not that personal, insightful. Here's my dating life. Here's here's what I had for breakfast, kind of guy. But yeah. like a he he liked. He was more like a Rory Scovel or a Stephen Wright, like you know, off the wall bizarre jokes and. And he was not my style, but he was definitely not Lisa's style, which I found oh. really funny. So I was really enjoying <laughs> looking at her as she rolled her <laughs> eyes. Um, he did t- say re- one really funny joke. I, I wonder if I can remember it. Probably not. Did Lisa like uh, Chris Gethard and the she experience? Did. I think that she did end up liking it a lot. Um, he talked about you know what it's like to be a nerd and and um, his his life story, which is always I always find interesting. So, um, so yeah, it was two wonderful, successful nights of stand up. So I definitely recommend uh, listening to Beautiful Anonymous. Um, I just made Brad listen to an episode. He just recently dropped an episode where uh, the caller was deaf and was using a translator. Oh. So the voice that we were hearing was the voice of the translator, hmm. but she was translating what Chris was saying in sign. And the listener, or I guess not listener, but the the podcast participant, um, was signing back, and we got to find out what it's like to be a deaf person who is into podcasts. Mm. And he talked about how uh, he used his work to transcribe the podcast so he could read podcasts, and he tried reading, and he likes comedy podcasts. He likes he's into the same stuff that I'm into, and he mm. talked about you know. Uh, how it's hard to listen to comedy bang bang or read comedy bang bang, which I could imagine would be because it's a, like a lot of character work and stuff like that. Yeah. So I definitely, I highly recommend that episode. Uh, the the caller was really cool. He seemed also to be in into uh, comedy and entertainment and that kind of thing. And it was just interesting to get that perspective because it's something, uh, you know, where the hearing world definitely sees sees things a certain way. And, and, you know, the deaf community looks at it very differently. So, so it's just a, another way to get insight into other people's lives, which I love. So, yay. That's me. That's my weekend work. All right. Brad, what do you got? Um, I, you know, I wanted to start off uh, talking about how uh, Adam West is, has left us. Um, he died on June 9th, Friday night, in his home. Uh, with after a brief battle with leukemia, yeah. and um, you know, we talk about this type of thing a lot on this podcast. Uh, it it happens every time uh, somebody passes away that had some kind of impact on your creative life. You see it all over Twitter, and you know, there's there is a joy that comes with the passing of a legend like Adam West. Seeing uh, the fan community respond with heaps of love. And, you know, Adam West's Batman in particular, you know, he he had a career outside of um, the Cape Crusader. You know, most recently, you know, he's Mayor West on Family Guy. And, mm-hmm. you know, one of my joys of going to see Adam West at the 2010 Philadelphia Comic Con was being in that line with my odd, you know, my 8 by 10 of, of, of Bruce Wayne and seeing all the kids around me have their eight by tens of Mayor West, and, and and how wild is that for him to discover a new character uh, so late in his career and such a success with that character as well? Um, that's wonderful. But you know what I want to talk about is how 
the geek community has embraced the 1966 Batman television show um, over the last, uh, I was going to say like 20 years, but that's not right. It's probably like the last five years. And in reality, it's probably due to the fact that the licensing rights for Batman 66 were finally worked out. Um, and we've now started to get the Blu-rays finally. And wait, so that that wasn't always a, a thing. Like they, I everybody... the, the 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 '66 television show was unavailable to us for a long, well, well, long I, time. Well, I don't mean its availability. I mean it's like fandom. Like I thought that that was... no. I mean when I was a kid, uh, Adam West was uh, reviled. Um, you know because that was the the campy batman we wanted you know the 1980s we wanted a dark knight we mm. wanted frank miller's batman we wanted alan moore's the killing joke um and you know through the 80s and the reinvention of this gritty um avenger uh that's what brought us to tim burton's batman and i remember in 89 uh, being relieved that we are going to get a serious take on the character that all us kids knew that Batman was a uh, 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 an adult figure was was a uh, something to take seriously as seriously as you would take any other um, action hero. You know he should be treated the way we treat uh, Commando. All of these notions are so laughable to me now because you look at all those things. Even you know Tim Burton's Batman. There's so much camp in that mm -hmm. that I think at the time because it was mixed with this goth violence um, and and this very unique Burton esque point of view, we saw it as a much more serious outing for the character. But there's a lot more in common between Adam West's Batman and Michael Keaton's Batman than we knew at the time. Yeah. And, but you know, when at the, in the nineties, as you know, Batman had his back broken by Bane in the nightfall series, this was, this is what we wanted, this intense masculinity for this character. Um, and we did not want the bright colors. We did not want the Dutch angles of Adam West. And, as time progressed and as Adam West's only three years that show was on TV, mm -hmm. like Star Trek, it had a tremendous impact, but it was only there for three years and it lasted a good long time on Nickelodeon. That's, you know, that's where I watched it mm. on reruns after school. Um, but as, as Burton's Batman, you know, led to uh, the animated series, the Bruce Timm series, and there is this weird dip where Schumacher's character, uh, the, the both the Val Kilmer and the George Clooney one, really embrace the quote unquote uh, comic bookiness of the Adam West era. Then that was reviled and and pushed away. And in the aughts, when we had Batman Begins, and in two thousand eight, when we had The Dark Knight, finally fandom was like, yes, this is the you know, Michael Mann esque crime epic that we know this character can support. And now adults can take it very, very seriously. But what's been interesting to me, um, since really since Zack Snyder's gotten a, a hold of it, um, with BVS and how I think there is a correlation with the rejection of a certain section of the fan community towards BVS and the ultra seriousness and the ultra masculinity and this final embracing of the bright night of Adam West's Batman. And now we can watch the shows on streaming. We can watch them on our Blu-rays. We can buy the action figures. We can buy the Hot Wheels Batmobiles and as we saw with Adam West's passing, you have all these people coming out and saying, you know, how much his iteration of the character meant to them. But that was not true in 1995. That was not true in 2002. Um, I think as we as as we see this intensity, this, um, and, and I don't necessarily agree with the, you know, the bromification of Batman that Zack Snyder has created. Um, 
and, and as people have found a distaste with that ultra seriousness, there is a desire to embrace a more quote unquote Marvel way of superheroes, which is a balance of light and dark uh, that you see in the MCU. I, I, th- I think that's really the flavor that the current pop culture wants of their comic book characters mm-hmm. and the, you know, death wish eighties version of the dark Knight is not in favor with the majority of the audience. I think it is certainly with some, um, but not, not with the majority anymore. I don't know. Um, but going back to Adam West, he was certainly the introduction to the character for most of us, if not all of us. And now that those shows are available to me, um, they are a, a true treat to the comic book fan because they really are deep dives into the canon. Um, they explore the weirder realm of comic books. And what Adam West did so well, and what you know, Julie Newmar and Burt Ward, uh, Cesar Romero did so well, is they played their characters very earnestly. They, they had a deadpan style of performance that only heightened the humor and the enjoyment of these primetime adventures. And, you know, at the end of the day, what we've always talked about, and, you know, we've talked about it uh, on various Superman uh, episodes of It Mod. We've had, we've talked about it on our Fistful of Batman episode that we did prior to the release of BVS. There are so many iterations of this character. And at the end of the day, none of them are the iteration you know the spectrum of batman is what's interesting you know adam west's batman is as much the batman as christian bales or ben affleck's or bruce timms or scott snyder's or grant morrison's and that's what makes a character like that last for almost 80 years i think of it as like and and not being uh facetious or patroners I, I think of it as like a rainbow like a rainbow isn't just the one color it's the many different colors and the spectrums that make the whole of it so special and i think batman is like that the different interpretations you know all together is symbolize just the fact that batman could be and mean so many things to so many different people and that we need different versions of batman at different times mm-hmm. in our life too and i would urge people when you watch uh, BVS uh, or the upcoming Justice League and you are initially wanting to reject the Batfleck <laughs> or or this ain't my Superman. Henry Cavill's not my Superman. Understand that he this this version is just another link in a glorious chain mm-hmm. um, of mythology. And we need these different interpretations to carry the love of our of our characters. Because uh, I mean, it's it's always, I mean, specifically talking about films. I mean, and in a lot of the people who are fans or detractors of these films and, and the cinematic interpretations of the characters may not necessarily be fans of these characters uh, or familiar with them in comic book form for them to know that when the comics is no different, like you have different versions of this character with different backstories, different histories and reboots and retellings and reinventions, but also different tones, different artists, uh, different writers. So I think that, you know, if, if you're, if you, because it's a comic book character, if it, you're made more aware of the origins of the stories and the types of ca- characters these that they that they come from, then you would understand that this he isn't Ben Affleck isn't going to always be the only Batman. He's not going to be the only Batman. He's not going to be only the only type of Batman. You look look at our cinematic history of the character right now and see that, like you just mentioned, there has been the Adam West, there's been the Tim Burton, there's been the Christopher Nolan, there's been the Zack Snyder, and 
There's been, you know, the Frank Miller Batman. There's you got the Capullo Batman. And so those characters, like you, you, you talk about it all the time when we talk about casting. Uh, no actor is bigger than the character. Like there will always, it's going to always be some change and an evolution. I think. So I, I had a couple thoughts in the with the with the passing of Adam West. One, uh, watching people uh, pour their 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 love for his interpretation of Batman, I found profoundly moving. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that because we've had all these different iterations, we can now watch the '66 Batman in its own universe because we have all these other versions. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, at Awesome Con this uh, past weekend, they set up this memorial wall uh, for people to, you know, bring up their pens, their Sharpies, and write a little message to Adam West. And you saw so many different... Um, passionate and uh, mournful, respectful responses to this character, this actor who was once dismissed easily on my playground in elementary school in 1989 Mm. on, on the eve of Tim Burton's Batman. And we were so sure of ourselves. That that was not Batman, and and I find myself still behaving that way, where I'll be driving um, down the road and a kid'll be riding up on a bike and he'll have a Superman shirt on, and in my head I'll often go like, yeah, but what's his favorite issue of the character? Yeah, and and that bit of fanboy shaming that we are also easily prone to. We need to work on that. Um, when you're at Comic Con uh, and you know someone, uh, you know, says that they have never uh, read Grant Morrison's Superman, All Star Superman, you shouldn't respond like, "What? How can you call yourself a Superman fan if you haven't read Grant Morrison's Superman? That's ridiculous." Yeah. You know, you can't just l- watch Christopher Reeve movies and call yourself a Superman fan. Yeah, you can. Mm-hmm. Um, don't don't create the bubble. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you know, don't create the cage to keep out other fans. Um, you know, seeing a kid in a Superman shirt should be uh, a, a a joyous thing. You know, he's, he's one of the clan, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he's one of us and it's sure. It's an opportunity like, Oh man, you, you know, you know, you love Superman. You, you should check this out. Take a look at all-star Superman. Mm-hmm. But if they don't like all-star Superman, that doesn't make them less of a fan. Yeah. And I don't know. It's, it's something that I, you know, while you're waiting in line at awesome con, while you're waiting at line at San Diego, those, uh, conversations, uh, f- you know, ripple down uh, the, the the sea of people. Yeah, and uh, I think we should all just check ourselves uh, before we reject somebody's version of a character, somebody's version of the love. They don't love it the way I love it. That's just silly. Yeah, I, I think we could just do a quick language update when you find out someone hasn't seen something. Instead of going with the attitude like you haven't seen seen that, you know what Blade what Runner? Have you, have you been wasting your time? The attitude is, oh, what wonderful things you have before you! You get the opportunity to see Blade Runner for the first time. Oh man, I, you're gonna love it! You're gonna love it! Yeah. You haven't read All Star Superman? You know what wonderful reading you have ahead of you. Yeah. I think that um, that that's going to be the kind of attitude that keeps the the nerd geek culture welcoming and warm. Mm-hmm. And it is happening. I mean, that's why you go to Awesome Con and you do see uh, a diverse group of individuals. It's it's not like it once was. We are becoming more and more uh, warm uh, of a community. Oh, yeah. gosh. Remember that guy at that first T-shirt stand? 
Okay, me. so I mean, but so all right. Let, I mean, let's talk about that because yeah. that's what I'm. That that's the guy I'm talking about. That's when I'm when I'm watching everybody go on about how much they love Adam West now, and I'm thinking about the times when people didn't like Adam West. Uh, the, the and 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 that very rigid fan. The guy I'm talking about is your encounter, Lisa. Yeah. So Brad and I had literally freshly just walked in to uh, Awesome Con and gone to the first table of T-shirts to flip through. Because we have a strategy. You got to go aisle by aisle. You got to go aisle by aisle. Left to right. So you don't miss anything. Lucky for me, because I have no sense of direction. So I really need Brad to to lead me through aisle to aisle. Um, But at this first table of T-shirts, you know, I like a lady cut of T-shirt. Because I'm a lady-shaped person. And um, so uh, the guy was in the process of apologizing for only having, like, one row of lady cuts of nerd t-shirts. Um, it's a battle we're still fighting. Exactly. And it's totally fine. Because, you know, I can also wear a unisex-shaped t-shirt. That's just not my t-shirt preference um, in general. And... um so he was kind of going, like, his attitude was, he started out by apologizing that this is all he had, but then he wanted to make it sound like it's because he ran out of all of the other girl t-shirts, because the girls are now buying out all of the t-shirts, and so he started saying, isn't it wonderful now that boyfriends have gotten their girlfriends into comic books so that now girlfriends can now buy female cut comic book shirts to please their boyfriends. And I couldn't, (laughs) my mind was blown. And I, I just kind of like put my head down and I said, yep, that's why women buy t-shirts to please men. And so he immediately started backpedaling. And I just said the sentence out loud. I was like, it's okay. Just don't say that to any other women and you'll be fine. But I, I could not believe that. And then he started to backpedal further and he's like, you could probably school me in some characters. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I like what I like. Just don't judge people as they walk up to your table. But I could not believe that guy. It was silly. Us uh, late 30-year-old white men <laughs> have a lot to learn. He, his excuse was, well, my wife, she's not into this stuff, but she knows that I am, so she'll wear a T-shirt. And I'm like, well, she sounds really nice. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, we got progress to make. <laughs> that, that, uh, not everybody. Just that guy has some progress to make. So if, you know, as if you get to see, if you see other types of people as people, give yourself a high five. Yay. But this guy had some, <laughs> this guy had some growing to do. And at the end of the day, what I want to say is if you've never experienced Adam West's Batman um, because you've thought it was too silly or goofy looking, um do yourself a favor. Go to the third season. Find the episode in which Batman and the Joker uh, battle their uh, dispute using surfboards, <laughs> and you'll you'll find a, a good time to be had. Yeah, as a monkeys fan, I love that era of television. It's just good stuff. I watched that shit all the time as a kid. That's why I don't know that because I grew up watching that as a kid. I that's why I was. Surprised that that Adam West wasn't always beloved as that character, even as different interpretations came about. Like, you know, yeah, I, I remember the opening weekend when Burton's Dark Knight, uh, Batman came out, and then seeing Michael Keaton and oh shit, that Batman movie was so I mean, cool. But- your your experience just might be different than mine, but I I certainly and, and you know your experience might be different because when I was. That kid in 1989. I was an old man already. Well, I, I, I didn't want that goofy kid stuff. Yeah. I wanted adult action. Yeah. Like commando. Yeah. Adult manly action. Yeah. Well, I mean, at that time, had you, uh, were you already um, aware of like Batman as a, as a tragic uh, and grim figure uh, of, you know, Vigilantism and uh, when the, that came, when that um, movie came out, I had just dipped my toe into comic books. Okay. So I was ten years old, and um, I, 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 
I, you know, in my mind and in my memory, take that for what it's worth, I had a very serious idea of what that character should be. Well, and I, mean, I think I can see not just for you, but for everyone else who would say, oh, I mean, Adam West is not, especially like you just mentioned, like you have some people who are fans of the character only from uh, fans of Christopher Reeves, Superman, only from the movies and not know about Grant Morrison's take or, or, or Zack Snyder's take. So maybe, I mean, I could see why, like if you come from the comic standpoint, then that's well, your first impression so, of Bruce Wayne. I mean, well, the other thing is, uh, as I was growing up in comic book stores, comic book stores in the uh, 90s were the oh, most yeah. judgmental places on the planet. That's where you get the Simpsons comic book guy from, yeah, right? Yeah. That, 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 that parody is there for a reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. All right. Well... Uh, Adam West, uh, rest in pictures. The rest in pictures, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and then you know the, the the from the movie side, the thing I'll, I'll send us out, and I don't want to talk about it too much because uh, I've been rambling on too long already. But at the Alamo Draft House, one Loudon for the Secret Society of Filmmasons this past Wednesday, we all got to see the cinematic classic, Michael Winner's Death. <laughs> Wish three. Yay, a first watch for me. A first watch for Lisa. And I definitely want to talk to Lisa about her experience with that movie. But, you know, the Death Wish franchise. Talk about the grim 1980s, mm. right? You know, Bernie Getz and all that in New York City. What a cesspool. Um, the, the, the amount of fear running through our country thanks to the news media. Um, Death Wish 3 is a fucked up <laughs> movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the Death Wish films one and two are are grotesque certainly you know the story of Paul Kersey his wife being raped and murdered uh, and he's helpless to do so and the story of the first film is how you know his inability to get revenge on the men who did it leads to this Batman like crusade in which he takes to the streets at night with a revolver and starts killing pickpockets and dope fiends and just poor uh, idiot individuals uh, who are uh, unlucky enough to get in front of his revolver. It's a really uncomfortable movie to watch, yeah. um, especially with you know my politics of today. <laughs> um, but it, it is a film that I find to be incredibly powerful and dramatic. I think the first Death Wish uh, is, you know, it's grotesque, but there's a level of seriousness that, you know, you watch it like a horror film. And Death Wish 2 tries to replicate it, but now you're, you know, it's the 80s. Everything's got to be a sequel. It fails to do so. It's a pale imitation of the original film, whether you like it or not. Now, Death Wish 3 is where you start to see the influences of franchises like Rambo um, and, you know, the Schwarzenegger movies, the Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. And now Charles Bronson finds himself in a successful series of let's go kill some guys. And Death Wish 3, Paul Kersey returns to New York after having his wife raped and murdered after having his daughter raped and murdered in the second film. And, well, like, who's going to die this one? You know, uh, well, it's his his old Korean war buddy. Uh, he's living in a really crappy um, neighborhood, and the local gang uh, in which Alex Winter uh, of Bill and Ted is, yeah. a, uh, is a proud member has been terrorizing this community of old people. <laughs> and... You know they've they've been breaking into their houses. They've been forcing them to pay protection. Um, they've been raping their uh, wives. Uh, it it still has all the despicable, disgusting elements of the first two Death Wishes films, but now Death Wish Three is is looking for cheers, is looking for applause from its audience. Uh, you know. Oh man, Paul Kersey, he's just going to get some mail order machine guns and some rocket launchers <laughs> and he's going to commit this one man war on 
uh, this gang. And as an ironic watch, as a, as a fan of the good, bad movie, it's a, it's a lot of fun to watch. It's so ridiculous. It's yeah. so, uh, offensive and, 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 and abrasive in its politics. You know, I, I can't remember when, but at some point I turned to Lisa and I said, this was Fox News's wet dream. <laughs> um, and as such, it was a ton of fun to watch with a crowd willing to embrace the insanity of its morality. Yeah. Um, but I, I just couldn't help but feel kind of scuzzy. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that is definitely part of the desired effect. But in Death Wish 3, it's just so... It's so exploitative, and I love exploitation films, but maybe because of where I am right now, and maybe where because where our country is right now, um, I had I had a difficulty watching it as a canon film entertainment yeah. in a way that I have not experienced before. I I think I had a similar experience when we saw Assault on Precinct Thirteen right. mm-hmm. uh, most recently. Um, I don't know, like at, at the AFI, yeah. yeah. Hmm. I don't know, and you know, I I still rated it four stars on Letterbox. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I still think it's a, um, uh, I, you know, I don't want to call it a work of art, but it, it is a film that so deeply represents a place in time, um, and and the state of, um manufactured fear i do think it's an interesting sociological watch and has value as such yeah um you know it's it's idea of subtlety is um quite terrifying <laughs> yeah. but yeah so death wish 3 i'm so glad i got to see it on the big screen and i really do love charles bronson and i really do love the ridiculousness of that film. And it was great to hear everybody laughing, but behind every hoot and holler, I had like this stabbing pain in my soul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many first timers were in there? Oh, it was a good chunk of people. Yeah. I mean, Lisa, what do you, what do you think about what I'm saying? I think that you're not wrong. I think that even though the film is wrong headed, Maybe in its message, it definitely promotes a fear of young people, a fear of unchecked poverty in in that um, it'll turn violent. Um, I It was interesting that that the um, the the gang, I almost called it a club. I guess the, the gang <laughs> what is like a multiracial, colorful group of young Males mostly, but there were some. Chicks. It was like the Warriors. Like the, yeah. if the Warriors had gone bad, <laughs> they had this kind of uh, brightly, like they this like brightly colored symbol that they all had painted on their faces. Um, cool design, not gonna lie. It, but it was fun to see, like, because there were like white dudes wearing swastikas alongside of like African Americans and Asians. I was like. Okay, at least you found a, like a common ground. Yeah, they hate old people. Of old people, yeah. um, there was an element that I didn't anticipate where, where there were like these Home Alone style spring loaded traps for people breaking in windows. Because Paul Kersey would set up your neighbors. Oh with yeah, some spiked boards. Yeah, if you if you go you 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 fill him with some really lovely Polish Jewish food, he will put glass underneath your windows. <laughs> Um, or the, like the spring loaded spikes, which was really fun. Um, I did find the, um, Shriker, the main, like the main guy, he had like this reverse mohawk. Um, I found him legitimately menacing and I, I would wonder like, what was the rest of this guy's career? Like, cause he was really fucking but there's scary. There's this scene where Charles Bronson goes out to bait the gang mm-hmm. and there's this one character called the giggler. Oh yeah. And he, he's, he's the purse snatcher. Right. And oh, so yeah, yeah. he puts like this, <laughs> he, he gets like this Nikon camera uh, uh, in his carrying case. And he goes, I'm going out for ice cream. And he starts walking down the street, spinning his camera. And here comes the giggler to snatch it, which he does. But Oh no, 
Charles Bronson, Paul Kersey, has just mail ordered this ridiculous <laughs> magnum. Amazon Prime, clearly. Yeah, which is like as big as his torso. What? He pulls it out and he blasts the giggler in the back. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's, I don't know, like, would, would Commando do that? I don't know. Um, some of my favorite scenes were the the romance scenes between uh, oh, Kersey and the young uh, public defender. Oh, boy. I would have loved to see more of her public defending. She seemed like a real c- capable lawyer. But the, um, this, the dialogue scenes between them, I can't even repeat because they were such utter nonsense. It was like um, if you, like, put the dialogue into Google Translate and then... <laughs> like two or three times and so you just really got this churned out like nonsense it was so nutty yeah but man the last if I mean, it was probably like 20 minutes but it felt like an hour of the film is devoted to this uh melee cars are blowing up <laughs> the police academy SWAT team comes in <laughs> Uh, you know, grenades are being launched. Rockets are being propelled. Yeah. Uh, the this the, the set that is totally not New York City is <laughs> in flames, and it's kind of wonderful as a time capsule. Death Wish Three. That movie is nuts. But yeah, so make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It was a fun watch, and the audience the audience loved it. Yeah. And we got a picture. It was Brian Loy's birthday, so uh, happy birthday to uh, programmer assistant Brian Loy extraordinaire. That's right. Um, and this was his his birthday movie. Oh, and we did get a really cool intro, uh, a pre-taped intro from Charles Bronson expert Paul Talbot mm. uh, talking about where Death Wish 3 falls in the Death Wish 5 film franchise. That's five of those films. Yep. There's Death Wish 4, which is the one where he fights the mob, and then there's Death Wish 5, in which he fights Michael Parks. I don't think I've seen the fifth one. The fifth one's not good. Uh, four and five are not good. Yeah. You really only need to see up to three. All right. Uh, what else you got? Is it? I mean, that's it. Um, you know, uh, just to circle back on Adam West, I finished the week by watching the animated film The Return of the Caped Crusaders. How was that? It was great. Yeah. It is a perfect recreation of three episodes. I mean, they're, they're, it's not an adaptation of three specific episodes, but it has a three-episode format, and it feels like it could have come out in 1966 or 1967 hmm. with the added bonus of being able to do some rather fantastical elements with animation. Yeah. It's awesome. And we're going to be getting a sequel to it Adam West had already recorded the sequel with Two-Face, who never appeared in the original series. Uh, At one point, Clint Eastwood was theoretically going to play that version of Two-Face for the TV series, by the way. Oh, my God. But guess who they got to voice Two-Face? Who? William frickin' Shatner. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. What? Yeah, so I'll be buying that. (laughs) The day it comes out. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh shoot, for I have that done so much. Um I uh I I I'll just talk about uh I'll make three highlights. Uh so back on the seventh of June, I caught the mummy at the Alamo Draft House for the Secret Society of Filmmates and Screening. The original mummy, the nineteen not the original oh, the, the nineteen thirty two uh mummy. The Boris, Boris Karloff. Karloff. Yes. Yeah. And um, you're like, this is my new favorite movie. <laughs> wow. I see why everyone loves it. So I, I, you know, obviously they show that in um, in preparation for the release of Tom Cruise's uh, attempted summer blockbuster. <laughs> um, and so I hadn't, I couldn't remember if I had seen this film uh, as a kid. Um, I I remember The Wolfman. I remember uh, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein. I remember Dracula. Um, but I, I wasn't sure if I had ever seen the mummy. Um, my recollection of the mummy up until, up until actually seeing it at the Alamo draft house was always, um, the, the, the snippets you would see in any highlight reel or any ad. Or I thought anything. you were going to say the monster squad. Well, that, I mean, that, so that, I'll, I'll get to that, but then that's what 
was one of the interesting things about this viewing for me was that because the images I had in my mind were of the iconic shots, black and white images of the mummy, um, I was surprised to find out that in this film, the, the, the image of the mummy, if you were to think about the mummy, if you're of the same mind as me, you thinking, you're thinking of a bandaged, you're thinking of the Monster Squad-esque uh, uh, visage of the mummy with bandages and um, you know you can see the the, the decayed face, and the eyes around you know a, a face around the eyes, and the moaning and the arms outreach. But in this film, like that, never really shows. You don't see that mummy. You you see Boris Karloff in a you know really good um, in a really good uh, you know practical effect makeup. Imhotep. Yeah, and I mean that, that's it. And so that was the first thing that was. Uh, striking to me was that I never got the the mummy. So it's almost like when you realize that Jason doesn't wear the hockey mask in the first fright of the 13th film. Or the second the, one. Or the second one, yeah. And so that was that was shocking to me. And and it made me wonder, okay, why like why is he, the mummy considered like one of the universal monsters, especially I mean, coming from this film, like this one, you know, this with Dracula, Wolfman and the creature from the Black Lagoon. Like why is the mummy Consider and then and if he he's considered that when how come when you think about the mummy it's never Boris Karloff's image of the mummy it's of a mummy wrapped in bandages because he doesn't look like that in it, the film it comes out in the sequels right um, the mummy has always been my least favorite of the Universal monster movies my favorite is the version you see in the Monster Squad oh, yeah absolutely uh, mummy came in my room yep. Um, and, and I just I found I find the 32 film to be rather boring. Now I have not watched it since I was like 18, so it's been 20 years. You talk about having a particular experience watching Death Wish three um, as an adult now, and with in, in, in our political climate and with um, the maturity you have, you know, have, having grown up since seeing it as a you know a younger person. You know, just just we had this really big um, cultural impact with Wonder Woman just being released, and what that meant to a lot of women around the world, and and, and um, how that spoke for strong representation of women on the screen and in the in the world period. So then I go to this film, and yes, I know it's a film from the 1930s. Oh man. But a lot of great w- women performances in that movie. It's so fucked up because okay, here's the story of the mummy. So um there's a there's an there's an uh, archaeological dig uh, uh, a a mummy um a tomb is excavated. Inside is the mummified remains of Imhotep. Um and but he is not mummified like a normal person of that time would be. He was actually mummified alive. So he didn't die, and then they removed all of his insides, and then they wrapped him up. He did, he, they wrapped him up while he was still alive. Because basically, he he uh, he did something he wasn't supposed to. He was, he was in love with a, a woman that he wasn't supposed to be associating with. So they killed him, and then she died. So what he was trying to do... No, no, she died, and he was trying to bring her back to life. And, and he wasn't supposed to be dealing in the black art, the dark arts or whatever, so he got mummified alive so when he comes back to life his goal similar to the one in uh the brendan fraser film he wants to resurrect his his lost love his long lost love similar to the plot of the new mummy also yes and so this guy this younger guy uh is one of the people on site uh, archaeologists who uh, who excavate him and find him he ends up uh, reading out this curse aloud and bringing him back to life. Imhotep wanders off. This younger guy's like, oh shit, uh, uh, the mummy just escaped. And then you flash forward to the future, a couple of years or whatever. And there's this younger guy who uh, he's associated with the Arch- archaeological society or the dig from earlier in the film. And basically, he meets this woman at this party. Unbeknownst to him, this woman is the reincarnation of Imhotep's long lost love, right? But he meets her at a party and he's smitten with her, right? And so, right as he's meeting her and he's like, "Oh man, like I, I'm, I'm digging on this chick," Imhotep starts to do this, this cast this spell to, you know, contr- not really control her mind, but to communicate with her from, you know, he's not 
he's not close to her. So he's communicating with her telepathically. She gets this blank face look, wanders off from the party, goes to the museum where Imhotep is uh, getting ready to do this ritual to bring her, you know, uh, to, to restore the, him back to life. <clears throat> Excuse me. So she passes out on the steps of the museum. The guy who was smitten with her at the party sees her on the steps, picks her up, takes her back to his place. Instead of dropping her off at the hospital or whatever, takes her back to his place. And as she comes to, he's like, you know, um, don't be alarmed. I, I saw you passed out. I saw you at the party and then I saw you passed out on the steps of the museum. Um, you know, I don't normally do this, but uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that I, I think I'm falling in love with you. Like this whole love at first sight thing, right? So she's like, you know, okay, thanks for, you know, helping me out. But, you know, kind of chill out. Meanwhile, she still got Imhotep like uh, telepathically in her mind, so she's not sure what's going on. So she, she wants to go to Imhotep. Now, regardless of if she wasn't under his mind control or not, this guy who just met her that found her on the steps that's telling her, like, I know it's kind of creepy. I don't normally do this, but I think I'm digging you. I think I love you. And leaning in to kiss her, like he kisses her, like he, she's making out with her. He just met her on the steps, right? <laughs> and he's making out with her. She gets this brain thing going on where she wants to go and she's uh, drawn to Imhotep. So she wants to leave. Again, even if that had nothing to do with Imhotep or not, these this guy is like, you know, I think you should stay. I don't want you to go. You should stay with me. Or you should basically not giving her a choice to do what she wants to do. Like, granted, you don't know this lady. Yes, you can be concerned about her well-being. But if she wants to leave, like, she's her own person, like, let her fucking leave. Like if she gets killed or killed by a mummy, then well, that was her fault, but you can't tell her what to do. Like she's her own woman. So basically the movie is, but love Darren. Hold on. But the, basically the movie is Imhotep trying to control her to make her be with him. And then this other guy trying to quote unquote, save her from Imhotep to make her be with him. And it was like, no one was letting this woman do what she wanted to do. And I'm watching it. First, I'm thinking, like, where's the freaking mummy? Where are the bandages? <laughs> Secondly, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, this was made in 1932, but this is a fucked up movie. Like, the, let her do what she wants to Let her make her own decisions. And it's so weird because, yes, I understand it's it's from a different era, but it's just, it's just still, to me, again, specifically where we are and where I am today and, and the father of a, of a, of a little girl being more cognitive in, in responding to those types of things, it's still just striking to me to see that for a woman like that, this depiction, that's why I, I can understand now why Gal Gadot, not that I couldn't understand, but it put into focus and it was a stark contrast on why her being a defiant woman saying, yeah, you're saying I can't go across this field, but I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. That's why I think it's such a. I could see why it's a big deal to certain women because it wasn't too long ago that women weren't allowed to make choices for themselves, like even in roles in, in films like that. And it was dressed up as, oh, well, he loves her. But at the end of the day, she doesn't love her love wasn't reciprocated to him in that film. Like, so yeah, you can love her and you, you want her well being, but she doesn't feel the same about you, dude. Let her go. You know what I mean? Imhotep, dude, she said she don't want to be with you. She changed her mind. Leave her the fuck alone. And everybody's trying to control this woman. And I don't know. Maybe I was just looking too deep into it, but it was just weird. It was I didn't like that. I didn't like that about the film. And so I didn't. I didn't think it was scary. And again, I'm thinking, well, maybe back then because they didn't have a bunch of special effects. They didn't have Stan Winston. They didn't have John Carpenter. So maybe this was scary to them. But even then, like in, within the context of what was in that film, like it just I don't know. Like I just couldn't understand why the mummy was considered one of the universal monsters. Um, but I will say this, going to Tom Cruise's film, because I saw that a few days later, maybe like the next day, that movie's been getting a lot of hate uh, on the internet. Uh, it's not doing well at all at the box office. It was a disappointment. Because it's terrible. To the studio. Here's the thing. <clears throat> I don't know if it was because I had low expectations, because I was aware of the public's response to it before I went to see the Tom Cruise film, but... So I was like, I was prepared to go in there to to see what everyone else saw and be disappointed in the film, but I I didn't I enjoyed the film. I didn't Me think, too. I didn't think it was like, oh my god, this is the summer box office bomb, or oh, I want my 
two hours back. I, I, it wasn't like it was tripping all over itself like no. Fantastic Four. It was entertaining. It was an entertaining I mean, film. I mean, I, I agree that it's definitely not as bad as some critics were labeling it. It is not the worst film of the year. It is not the worst film of the summer. And it's certainly not the worst Tom Cruise movie, as some might have you believe. I, I don't think but so But it was, <laughs> for me, incredibly dull. Yeah, he found it boring. I found it entertaining. I, I found it entertaining. I, I mean, it was like a it... little bit by the numbers, but I mean, I went in kind of expecting that. I went in expecting that I would enjoy Tom Cruise's performance. He was fabulous. I did like Cruise, and I liked what um, a buffoon he was and what a dick he could be. Um, and he does some physical comedy or some facial comedy in the film that I really responded to, especially after... Uh, I won't spoil plot elements, but after the plane, uh, you know, the, the, the scene that you mm-hmm. see in all the trailers, that mm-hmm. crazy plane disaster, mm-hmm. after that sequence when he is recovering and he has the, the, the beer and the shot, his reaction to what he had just gone through was awesome. Yeah. And I would say, compared to the original film, and I know it's maybe not fair to compare the two, but there were things in this film that if I were someone new coming to the franchise, a younger kid or, you know, a preteen or a teen or whatever, there were some things regarding the mummy and her minions that were coming back. That what I would say was kind of was scary. So mm-hmm. do you like, I mean, do you even remember the last time you watched something like The Wolfman or Bride of Frankenstein or Dracula um, and your thoughts on those versus your thoughts on The Mummy? Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. I always liked Frankenstein, but I never viewed Frankenstein as a monster film. Even as a younger, even as a kid, um, Frankenstein was always hard for me to watch because I felt bad yeah, for him. Like sure, it, 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 mm-hmm. I, I didn't feel I didn't feel right watching. I felt like what's happening to him isn't fair. Like I didn't, well, yeah, because the horror is the humans of that yeah, movie. It always it, that Frankenstein never sat well with me. So I had a connection to that character totally void. That was totally devoid of anything. I mean, I didn't have a connection like that to anything in the Mummy. Uh, what was Frankenstein? Like, I remember thinking, having like conversations and thoughts with myself of why, why am I feeling that way? Like, why, if he's a monster, like why are they? Why do I feel bad for him like that? Mm-hmm. Or you know, people are being mean to him, and like he's not really. He's not really doing what I would characterize a monster. He's not terrorizing people. Well, like I said, I haven't seen The Mummy in a long, long time. But, you know, the story of the Wolfman, the story of Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, mm-hmm. those are very tragic uh, human experiences from the monster's point of view. Uh, incredibly relatable movies, uh, especially well-crafted films, where films like The Mummy and Dracula don't hold um, the thrill uh, for me, and like Creature from the Black Lagoon, I love Creature from the Black Lagoon, and that's like a proper, uh, you know, man in a suit monster movie. That's yeah. a ton of fun. Yeah. But honestly, Mummy, Dracula, I've always found them to be good starting off points for interesting mythologies elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, Especially Dracula. I love Dracula, mm-hmm. but not. The uh, Bella Lugosi Dracula. Yeah, there's some cool images and blah blah blah. So yeah, at the, I mean, at the end of the day, I had fun with the Mummy, and that's that's what I wanted to go into the movie. I at least want to not feel like I wasted my money or my two hours. And so I, I <clears throat> excuse me, I enjoyed it. Um, but that's pretty much what I what I did for my weekend. I took my daughter; she wanted to go see Cars three, so we saw that. Um, again, like this whole, I don't know, I don't know if we. I want to call it a revolution, but this whole, I mean, revolution of what's going on in media, cinema, television, um, the arts, but more specifically films with uh, women characters and how they're being pushed to the forefront. Um, If I I might spoil Cars 3, like that happens. Like it's not... It's not the movie isn't really about I mean just about Lightning McQueen. It's about the girl character. She's the new Lightning McQueen at the end of the film. They're Lightning pre- McQueen is transgender? The transgender we, automobile? Not yet. We cars five <laughs> or six, maybe we'll get there. But it's about, you know, okay, he thinks he lost his race because 
he lost his mojo. He has to get faster and get faster. But it's time for him to be the pit chief now and see something in someone else who just so happens to be the female car. Who That's nice. And so now it, it, it makes you think, okay, it's about Lightning McQueen getting back to be number one because you have the new, the new guard coming in, the new sleek you know, Tesla electric race cars. But it's not about that. It's about him saying, okay, I can still be a part of this thing that I love, but I can also get joy from nurturing and teaching someone else just like Paul Newman's character did in the first film. So, so it's basically Creed. Yeah. It, 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 holy shit. <laughs> it is. Uh, but she's not the son of uh, whoever he raced in the first film. Oh. Or daughter. She's who's the, she's who's the, Apollo? She's not the daughter. How does paternity work in this? Okay, so here's the thing. Like, I, I'm on the periphery when it comes to, like, cars, fandom, and also I'm aware that there's a huge part of the population that does not like cars. The people think it's the lesser Pixar film. But then there's the, the people who don't like it. They have these types of – there are these think pieces written about, like, how people are just weirded out by, like, the world of cars and how that works. And I've always been aware of it, but – for whatever reason, I made the mistake of falling into that rabbit hole and entertaining that question while I was watching this film, and it fucks you up. Like, <laughs> it's the baby cars. Like, okay, why are they baby cars? How are those baby cars made? How do they get bigger? Why do they have handles on their doors? Why do they have handles on their door? Like, yeah, when you start... Okay, it's making my fingernails itch. When you start thinking <laughs> about that shit, like, it fucks you up, and... So I yeah I don't I scoff but when I was a kid you know I I had brothers and sisters so we had you know little toy cars and and I would make them you know be families and go on dates and talk to each other so I I, I have no room to talk but, uh, yeah I, I don't about the sexuality of automobiles not even just to say but just the whole okay so um, in the film there is Tomato is using he's doing FaceTime with Lightning on an iPad. <laughs> okay, so Steve Jobs exists, like Apple exists. So where, what kind of car would Steve Jobs be? But how? Do they, how who, like how do they make? The, uh, okay, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Anyway, okay, that's going to do it for my weekend door because it's going to start weirding me out. Um, I will say this: uh, this coming uh, actually tomorrow, um, Transformers: The Last Night is coming out. It's being released this week, and uh, it's a Wednesday. Uh, a Wednesday no, release? No, no, it comes out tomorrow, Tuesday, because I have tickets for it. A Tuesday um, release. It's weird. That's weird. Like, a, so it's like a seven o'clock showing on Tuesday. They have seven, eight, nine o'clock. It's weird. Hmm. Um, so, in preparation for that, I've mentioned it before. I decided to go back and rewatch all of the Transformers. You mean rehate watch? I've seen your tweets, Darren. <laughs> here's the thing. I, I, I saved. Uh, I I purposefully have been tweeting out the negative and my complaints about the film, excuse me, because... <laughs> Whoa, the, Optimus Prime, calm down. The reason, the reason why I want to rewatch them is because when we do the review cast, I kind of want to talk about the franchise. I'm not going to go in depth about it, but I, I want to... You want the ammunition. Not really that, but see, here's the thing. Like I'm, I've taken enjoyment out of it. I don't want to save those things, the good things about the franchise and my rewatches. I want to save that for the discussion because you can go anywhere on the internet, listen to multiple podcasts or whatever, talk to anybody and bring up Transformers films and you're going to get negative conversation. You can get the negative opinions. You can get the hate from anywhere and it's easy to do that. And so I've been tweeting out my issues with the film because I'm getting that out of my system because I think there, obviously there is something in these films that a large part of the population enjoy or else we wouldn't be five films deep into the franchise with more spinoffs on the way, and they wouldn't make the insane amount of money that they make. And I, part of me is trying to go in there and, and just, I don't know, look at it from a different perspective and go, okay, what is it exactly that people are taking from this? And I got to say, like, and I have, I have points that I'll bring up. I, I, there are a few points that I can kind of see what people are enjoying about it. And again, that film is subjective. So some of the things that they find or the reasons why they like that franchise, I may never know or understand. But I will say that, you know, going back to rewatch the first and the second film, while difficult at times, um, it has been uh, eye opening. Like I haven't, I, I've had two unique experiences with the first and second film, um, looking at them in this critical light and so i'm actually i'm actually looking forward at the same time dreading this the last two in the the next two in the franchise but um 
I gotta say, like I'm excited to see the 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 this last film because it's weird watching the first film and seeing the trailers from the fifth film, knowing that Cade Yeager is back, Shia LaBeouf's character isn't in it. Seeing that first film yesterday and thinking about and having seen the films in between and thinking about like the the arc for his character, Megan Fox's character, who I'm surprised that. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about her. But just thinking about where that that franchise started and where it is, I mean, it it really is, it really is interesting in how. Yes, it, those films aren't necessarily the great films, but there is a singular like Michael Bay has not strayed and gone left and and deter from what he started out with, for better or for worse. Well, I'm looking forward to having that conversation because you have been on this podcast the biggest opponent to the Transformers oh, yeah. films. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm happy to hear you finding some bright spots along with, you know, jazz and whatnot. They're small spot. They're really small. <laughs> they're bright, but they're really small. But, yeah, they're, they're there. Um, so, yeah, uh, I double – okay, here's the thing. You double feature – this is how you watch the Raid films. You 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 never just put – if you have both Raid films – you never just put on the Raid 1 and just watch it. You never just put on the Raid 2 and just watch it. You have to watch them back to back. That's the proper way. John Wick. When you oh, watch man. Them- I thought you were going to say Transformers and Revenge of the Fallen. you got to watch them back to back because I know you did it. Oh, Transformers. I did. It helps. But <laughs> John Wick 1 and 2. When you watch those, if you own them both, now I can't watch just the first one. Or I can't watch just the second one. I think I I'm going to do that tonight. You should do that. It's. Uh, I still haven't seen John Wick 1. Oh, uh, there you go. Evening mate. Uh, he's gonna. The son is gonna go upstairs. His dad's gonna pour him a drink. Gonna say nice suits. Gonna punch him in the stomach. Why? So, close your eyes. Okay, yeah. sure. Thank you. I, I knew that already. All yeah, right, people uh, have warned me. But, That's the entire reason why I haven't watched it. But watch. But watch those films back to back. Having already seen John Wick, have you seen? Have you watched the first one since you've seen the second one? Uh, yeah. Did it feel different to you knowing that there's this other world? Yeah, you know, yeah, that that happened to me, and it made for a very I, interesting. Uh, two re-watch. made me like one much more. Same, uh, and I know you know because in this podcast again, we were kind of lukewarm on the first John Wick because mm-hmm. it came out so close to the Raid Two, and we were so high on the Raid Two. Mm-hmm. But Chapter Two of John Wick makes me appreciate the first film more. Mm-hmm. And the best stuff about Chapter Two, actually, the best stuff about the the first one. Is the stuff that's only hinted at in it, but you see it in the second one. And then for me, the best stuff about the second one is not the shooting stuff, but just the world building and mythology, the coin and and the, the and exchanges between Ian McShane's character and, and the other people and the and the continental stuff. It's all the the, the periphery stuff outside of the action sequences, which are which are in, impressive and amazing and, and technically and physical, you know, as far as a physical performance for Keanu Reeves. But like I was really struck again uh by the world building and again the first when during john wick one i just kept thinking about the second movie and man cashing is out there somewhere and all this other stuff is going on the continental there are people doing all and and eagerly anticipating the second film like okay i want to get to the second film not because i wasn't enjoying the first film but because it was such a strong connective tissue and so that this for me the biggest success of that this first two films is that that established world. Um, so yeah, that's been my weekend dork. Um, that was like twenty films, Darren. My bad. Uh, I was making it for Brian. He told me to he told me to fill in for him. Uh, he may or may not be back next week. Uh, of course, he'll be back next week. What could happen between now and then? I don't know. It's... Transformers it ruins him. Oh he's, no, he's he can never the show his voice week. again. Yeah. He's watching it over and over and over oh, again. Oh, I repeat. like your narrative better. <laughs> Uh, he did have a good time at Awesome Con. I don't know if you're following him at the Turtle Door One on Instagram. He uh, he got to meet Jason David Frank, which is the Green Ranger for anyone who's and he uh, got to he that. got to witness Stan Lee meet the Green Ranger. Yeah, so uh, he's been having he's been doing some geek related things. So he should have something to talk about when he returns. So we will look forward to that. Um, other than that, uh, our writing with a purpose episode. So it's the panel that Brad. Um, Emily and Liz, who was moderated by Liz, Liz Reed of At Colors and Rage, um, their panel from Awesome Con. I'm going to get that put up on the internet uh, here shortly, so be on the lookout for that. That'll drop on Wednesday. And then on Friday, be on the lookout for our Fistful of Netflix slash 
streaming. I may or may not have uh, something. What? No, you can't no, do that. it has to hold, be hold Netflix. On, hold, hold, That's hold, the whole point. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me explain. And this is the reason why we picked this. Um, so coming this is off the of, reason why Darren picked this. This is the reason why Darren picked this. So coming off of our discussion about um, that controversial statement made uh, from the director at the Cannes Film Pedro Festival. Maldivar. Pedro Maldivar. Pedro um, and, and, and one of the concerns that was voiced, uh, and it has been voiced many times, not just by people here at the podcast, but you know uh, the, the concern of films being dumped on streaming and then being lost forever and not and, and not spoken about and you know not finding an audience. So I figure. Well, we can help and we can help curb that by recommending titles that are put on streaming. So that, that is not how I approach this fistful nope. at all. Well, I'm saying this is the reason. This is the reason why I want to. I want to do this. Uh, but if that's why you're tuning in, d- oh no, no, that won't be. Well, that, that, that's, that's for, this is for, and that's for mine. That's why I say mine may include uh, picks that may be on Amazon because I want to put everything is available streaming. Then practically everything, but titles that you feel people aren't talking about anymore put those back out there so we were fighting that whole dumping titles on streaming and and the conversation is dead we're fighting that by bringing that conversation back i'm not up. changing my fistful no don't change it that's my purpose for putting hold on this is nothing new every <laughs> time we have a fistful my fistful will have a different slant Yeah, but you generally don't wherever. tease it on the first episode of the week so everybody turn, tunes in for your I feel, reason, I, I feel and everybody's obligated. disappointed. No, <laughs> I, they'll be surprised by yours, because you always do that, Lisa. You have a different slant on yours. Yeah, it's but always I'm, a big I'm tricky. And it's always fucking clever, too, uh, yeah. so stop. Not this time, so though. So stop. This is extremely standard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all on Netflix. But So this, this is... One stream forever. But that's the purpose. So stay tuned for our fistful of Netflix. When you hear these titles, also... So China- should it just be a fistful of streaming? No, 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 we'll do a fistful of Netflix. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be the rebel. But uh, hit us up on social media. Let us know your picks. We've already got some good picks. And I'm going to, we'll, we'll just be retweeting those and pushing those out because, again, we just want to get the conversation going about these films so more people can see them so that they can live on. Because that's the only way films will live is if people watch them uh, and then talk about them. They're like fairies. Like you just have to clap your hands mm-hmm. if you really believe. Yes. And squint real hard. Uh, Lisa, tell the people where they can find you. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at Sidewalk Siren. And also at Ukulele Killer. Yeah. <laughs> Brad Gullickson at Mouth Dork On. You can find me on all social medias at Mouth Dork, yep. yes. Um, and uh, you should take a look at Brian's reaction uh, video to the Black Panther trailer. It's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's a thing of beauty. Beautifully genuine, absolutely. And read my uh, five great Black Panther comics to read before February that mm. I just posted on Film School Rejects last week. That movie will be here before you know it. February is around the corner. It really is. Um and you can follow Brian William Young at the Turtle Dork on Twitter, at the Turtle Dork One on Instagram, and at Brian William Young on Facebook. Brad, did you untap that uh, Comic Con beer? I sure did. Yeah, we did. Did you get a special badge? I did not. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I did. I think it was a local farm badge. Okay. I'll take that. Mm -hmm. And I'm Darren Smith, the Disco Dork, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. That's going to do it for us. Thank you all for listening. Yay, we're back. Sorry we were gone so long. We missed you. Uh, That's going to do it for us. Thank you all for listening. Oh, we had a good revisit of Vanilla Sky, too. Yeah, happy birthday, Andy Gyerson. Alamo Winchester. Yes. uh, This is like the uh, Return of the King of episodes. Yep. (laughs) This is like nine endings. (laughs) Ten. That's going to do it for us. Thank you all for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week. And until next time. No, I can't do it. I'm leaving all this in, too. My dick is a Pringles can. I don't think those are the words. Nope, I can't play it. For the rest, you have to buy the album. Thank you. (laughs)